All right, well, let's go ahead and get rolling. First, I want to start off with an announcement about our next exhibit here at the Off-Broadway Gallery. It's in Boulder, Colorado. So if you live near the front range of Colorado, I encourage you to visit this uh, exhibit of a brand new artist, very talented, uh, technically skilled drawing. Um, it is Worlds Unseen, Mystery and Metamorphosis in the Art of Annie Dotto. Uh, you can see her quote there. I'll go ahead and read it because her, I included her quote on this poster because it really does a better job than I could have done in describing what this, her art is about, uh, its message. All things that exist in the light are grown in the fertile womb of the dark. The underworld is a mysterious and to some threatening place, but I see it differently. I see it as a nurturing place of possibilities yet to be born, a place to be constituted and reconstituted, a place from which we all come and go, a place that has held all the stories of the life, death, life cycle for eons, a place where all life returns to decompose and nurture more life, a place where a glorious unseen soil network humbly sustains everything we do up above. So Annie is giving us this uh, hidden world that is be beneath our soil and is expressing our vital relationship to that world. Her opening is April 14th from six to nine. There will also be a panel discussion as a part of that exhibit. And uh, if I highly recommend watching a documentary sometime during the month of April, if you want to visit this exhibit and understand it. And that is, the documentary is called Fantastic Fungi. It, I never thought I would enjoy a documentary about mushrooms, to be perfectly honest with you, but uh, this is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen on any subject. It's on, it's on all the major uh, uh, movie film networks on the web. I will be showing that film on April, 30th. That is a Saturday, kind of as a closing wrap-up sort of event. So if you don't get a chance to watch it on your own, uh, try to mark your calendars April 30th. It'll probably be 10 a.m. to noon. We'll watch that documentary and then have a lively discussion as a result. All right, let's get on to our presentation, the last in this series of Art Confronting the Isms. This one is on fundamentalism. Now this particular topic I've looked forward to researching because it was kind of a walk down memory lane for me. When I lived in Philadelphia while attending a conservative evangelical seminary, believe it or not, <laughs> exposure to the arts in that city, the fine art, the music, the film and literature challenged and transformed me. But before I tell you that story, like in previous presentations, I would like to begin with a definition to make sure we're all sort of on the same page with what fundamentalism is. I went to many websites looking for a thorough definition of fundamentalism, and honestly, one of the best was actually on Wikipedia. So that's the one I'm including here. Fundamentalism usually has a religious connotation that indicates unwavering attachment to a set of irreducible beliefs. However, Fundamentalism has come to be applied to a tendency among certain groups, mainly although not exclusively in religion, that is characterized by a markedly strict literalism as it is applied to certain specific scriptures or dogmas or ideologies, and a strong sense of the importance of maintaining in-group and out-group distinctions, leading to an emphasis on purity and the desire to return to a previous ideal from which advocates believe members have strayed. Now, I like this definition because it's broad and shows that a fundamentalist ideology can exist in any community, regardless of whether it is a recognized religion or not. In fact, I see examples of fundamentalism most clearly in our political discourse. Tuning into one of the major news networks is kind of like tuning into a mega church worship service with several televangelists, i.e. politicos, decrying the moral depravity of the opposing side. That's my experience. Well, first, why should we care about fundamentalism? 
Well, there's the idea that fundamentalistic beliefs can lead to violence. That is true. They can. But the majority of people, the vast majority of people who hold fundamentalist beliefs never commit acts of violence. I think it's that lingering fear that gets to us that a small minority of fundamentalists are capable of horrific acts of terror. And a large segment of the population believe that the only way to prevent such acts is to not tolerate fundamentalist thinking wherever we find it. So there's kind of a, a, a hostile reaction to fundamentalism. That's not why I'm presenting this topic, however. I want to address this issue because fundamentalism at its core diminishes the humanity of those deemed other or the outside group, the heretics, those not sufficiently of the like. Fundamentalism destroys our capacity for human connection, for compassion. Fundamentalism possesses an ugly divisiveness that lessens our experience of life. Now, if you are curious about this topic and really want to understand the history of fundamentalism and the fundamentalist mindset and what attracts people to such thinking, I recommend highly this book, The Battle for God, Fundamentalism in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam by Karen Armstrong. Now, it catapulted her to uh, quite uh, a level of fame because it came out in 2000. And of course, at the end of the following year, she was on everyone's speaking circuit to discuss fundamentalism, its threat, but also helping us to understand it better. Although Armstrong's focus is on the historical development within a religious context, the characteristics can be seen outside the walls of religious communities. Now, Armstrong describes fundamentalism as a late 19th and early 20th century religious reaction against modernity particularly the advances in science. The fundamentalist mindset develops when a community feels threatened. Fundamentalism views the distant past when the religion in question was founded as a kind of golden age that we should return to, at least in the way people think and behave. And fundamentalism divides the world into two main factions, good and evil. Now, this is very significant because fundamentalist communities need an evil power. They need it to define themselves against it. Now, just listen to the news and how people of different political parties speak about the opposing side. Civility and mutual respect are rarely, if ever, witnessed. The opposing political party is almost demonized. In fact, often is demonized. There's a kind of religious moral fervor I witness a self-righteous spirit in the rhetoric and tones of political debate. Fundamentalism at its core is about the need for certainty. Too much change and complexity in the world produce anxiety. So there is a deeply felt need for some kind of truth to anchor oneself to. And to the fundamentalist, there's only one kind of truth and that is capital T truth, the kind that can bring certainty. And the fundamentalist is the sole possessor of that capital T truth. Now, as I alluded to before, I have an intimate relationship with this topic because there was a time in my life, in my late teen years and early 20s, that I adopted some of the fundamentalist perspective. After college, I attended a seminary steeped in the fundamentalist controversy of the early 20th century that Karen Armstrong discusses in her book. There were several classmates of mine, listen to this, several seminarian classmates of mine who believed the universe was created in six 24-hour days. Now, that being said, one misconception many people have is that fundamentalists are stupid people. The truth is fundamentalists can have an enormous depth of knowledge on a particular subject. Many of my classmates at the seminary were intellectually gifted. Some of my professors intellectually brilliant. But with fundamentalism, it isn't a question of knowledge. It's a question of perspective. How broad is one's perspective on oneself and on the world? Well, while in seminary, 
this conservative seminary, regular exposure to art had begun to create fissures in the high protective walls of my citadel of certainties, if I can use that colorful language. Art imperceptibly, slyly, was stretching my perspective. I would visit the Philadelphia Museum of Art that you see here many Sundays since admission was free on that day. The Eastern art particularly created a sense of calm and, and uh, contemplativeness that I had previously thought was only available through prayer. After attending church in the morning where I was offered the gems of Big T Truth, I would visit the Philadelphia Museum of Art where I would receive a more subtle but nonetheless life-expanding gospel. And then one day I saw an advertisement for the Barnes Foundation exhibit. And it was this exhibit that acted like a wrecking ball, creating a massive hole in the high-walled fortress of certainty that I had built up. Alfred C. Barnes collected art that he believed could transform the viewer. He believed art could not only expand a person intellectually, but psychologically and spiritually as well. At the Barnes, the works are hung salon style, one over the top of another, and are also accompanied by complimentary pieces of furniture or crafts made of iron. And together, the experience is quite unique. Now, here's one work in that collection that I spent a long time looking at. Now, how do you think a conservative seminarian holding some fundamentalist perspectives Gazing on a work like this, The Joy of Life, how do you think I was affected? Well, it challenged my sense of certainty and helped me to welcome novelty into my life. The vivid colors of this painting struck me powerfully. The idea that these fleshly exhibitionists, that they seem to me, might be capable of experiencing joy without adhering to my truth, that idea challenged me as well. Well, after my experiences in the Philadelphia art scene, I became much more interested in the power of ideas as well as beauty to carry me to new heights of experience. And I became eager to figure out the mystery of why art has the power to open up a previously closed person. I found my story explained well in this book, When Art Disrupts Religion. The author and teacher, Philip Francis, interviewed former students of conservative evangelical colleges who had been exposed to arts programs. He studied students from Bob Jones University, an ultra conservative Christian school, which Though self-described as a fundamentalist Christian university, it uses that own language to describe itself, happens to have a school of fine arts. <laughs> Francis also studied alumni from a program called the Oregon Extension. Francis describes the Oregon Extension as a semester study away program in the Southern Oregon Cascades founded in 1975 by a small crew of renegade professors from an evangelical College in Illinois, Trinity. Each fall semester, this small school draws between 25 and 40 students from conservative evangelical Christian colleges and challenges them through fiction and poetry to ask difficult questions of their faith. Many alumni point to this semester in Oregon as the moment in which they disavowed the fundamentalist side of evangelical Christianity. That's in the words of one of the alums. That he interviewed. In his research, Philip Francis also interviewed a man named Jacob, who grew up with Pentecostal missionary parents serving a Navajo reservation. While in seminary in London, Jacob was exposed to the art of Mark Rothko at the Tate Gallery. Viewing these works, Jacob had a very similar experience to my own at the Barnes Foundation exhibit. Here's what he said about this transformational experience. 
I came into a room that was dimly lit. The space had the feel of a small chapel. Tall, dark paintings stretched from floor to ceiling. I sat with them for hours, soaking in the lines and colors, venturing into the empty spaces and the spaces beyond them. I'd later learned that Mark Rothko said, those who weep before my paintings are having the same religious experience that I had painting them. That's what was happening to me, and it was like no religious experience I'd had before. I can say with confidence, looking back 20 years later, there never would have been an undoing of my conservative evangelical worldview without this encounter with the transcendent work of Rothko on that rainy afternoon in London's Tate Modern. Indeed, if it weren't for the arts, Rothko and also Bob Dylan, Hemingway, Kerouac, to name a few, I'm not sure there would have been an unsettling of my religious certainties. Sometimes gradually and sometimes with immediate effect, aesthetic experiences burst the evangelical Christian bubble that was my world. Whether it was the result of visual art or reading the books of Fyodor Dostoevsky or watching the films of David Lynch and Ingmar Bergman or some combination of all of them, Francis reached two conclusions from his many interviews. One, that art unsettled a fundamentalist felt need for absolute certainty in matters of religious belief. And two, art unsettled their hard line of division between insiders and outsiders. How exactly does aesthetic experience break down rigid mental categories and perspectives? Well, perhaps it's more about anecdotal experience than something scientifically measurable. So let's try an experiment on ourselves right now. Let's take some time to observe some 20th century paintings, five of them to be exact. I invite you to follow the contemplative way of viewing each of these works. I included that on the right there. Read the painting, which means just look at it and take in the content, the subject matter. Reflect on it, both intellectually and, and reflect upon the emotions you're feeling as well. Then respond to it naturally in any way that seems appropriate for you. And then just rest with it in silence for just a few moments. I'm only gonna take a couple minutes per slide, so you'll have to get through that four-step process rather uh, quickly. I apologize, but I just wanna finish on time. So go ahead and do that with this work from Sonia Delaunay. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And I'm not going to ask any of you if you like these paintings. Liking isn't the point. It's what you're experiencing that matters. Let's move on to another.
Let's move on to our fourth work. Now for our fifth work, which is going to be in our upcoming exhibit in April. So all very different from one another. I'm going to include kind of a bonus De Chirico work that you can take a moment with before I read this quote. Philip Francis says, if philosophers in previous eras have waxed poetic about the soothing and elevating qualities of the beautiful, the modern aesthetic theorist tends to emphasize art's capacity to destabilize our certainties and disfigure ourselves. Let me ask you, when you were viewing the previous artworks, did you experience something destabilizing? I know when I first viewed works like these, my experience was not necessarily attraction to the work, but more like perplexity, like something within my mind or heart or some other mysterious place within was getting pulled and poked. Sometimes my mind, heart, or soul are all involved in the looking. And the art brought forth questions which usually result in an expanded perspective. Now, I don't know how anyone could take in regular doses of such art and not eventually experience a broadened perspective on oneself and one's world. Now, just wanna briefly mention, there is the idea floating around that our philosophical temperament and personality are hardwired that some people may have a predisposition towards fundamentalism. So we just wanna briefly address that. Many scholars in the field of psychiatry now believe that our personality is rather fixed and stable by the time we reach the age of seven. Researchers studied people over decades to determine that the vast majority don't waver much in their personality. And they've also identified these five basic personality types that nearly everyone possesses to greater or lesser degrees. So I'm gonna give you a moment to uh, look over these characteristics. There's extroversion, and you can rank either high on the scale or low on the scale. Same with conscientiousness, high or low. 
agreeableness, emotional stability. Sometimes this is referred to as neuroticism. Emotional stability, I guess, is a little friendlier term. And then finally, openness. Just take a brief moment to look at the characteristics of each category, of each personality type. Like I said, people are evaluated and placed on a high to low scale within each category. And so for example, in the extroversion category, I rank on the lower side, but it's that last category, openness, that is particularly relevant for our discussion. It should come as no surprise that people who rank very low in openness tend to be most susceptible to a fundamentalist mindset. Now, emotional stability, that category may also play a role, but it's most obvious in the last personality type. So what do we do with people that we discover rank very low in openness? Should we try to identify such types by the age of seven and then quarantine them from polite society? That sounds rather dystopian to me. Instead, something simpler. Why don't we just keep the arts in the regular curriculum of our grade schools? We know now that despite the stability of personality types over a lifetime, new neural pathways can be created in the brain and other pathways destroyed through a program of intentionality. Using the arts regularly for the expansion of our emotional and mental states is a good place to start. We also know that sometimes, and this is kind of rare, as the result of dramatic shifts in conscious experience, this mental rewiring of the brain can occur rather suddenly. A near-death experience, for example, a psychedelic experience, or in my case, in Jacob's, a sudden immersion into the arts, which within a few years, and that's pretty short time, within a few years, had altered my understanding of myself and my reality. Now, I have to admit that maybe I never was wired for an inordinate need of certainty. It could have been that my parents separated and divorced when I was 13, and that my father subsequently fell off the sobriety wagon. Maybe those events created enough anxiety and confusion in my life that I temporarily sought out the certainties of religious fundamentalism just to create more stability in my life. Regardless, no one is fixed in their perspective, at least theoretically. Anyone can change if put in a different environment and with enough intention to change. And that is why I champion the arts in our public schools and in our communities. It creates a healthy mental and emotional environment for children and adults to explore their thoughts and feelings. I believe the arts make us more sensitive in a positive sense toward ourselves and toward others. I believe the arts do make us more tolerant, which means I'm far less likely to demonize someone I disagree with. The arts foster a more expansive experience of life, which is personally more enriching. Now, I may not have been able to fully appreciate Henri Matisse's selective and inaccurate to reality use of color, when I first viewed this work at the Barnes. But I knew I couldn't take my eyes off this painting. It spoke a language I did not understand, but one I nonetheless enjoyed and wanted to learn. It invited me to see the world, to experience the world in fresh new ways. I wasn't fully aware of the science behind this alchemical magic that art seemed to possess. I still don't fully understand it, but I do believe, perhaps religiously, that the arts make my community a more beautiful and sacred place. 